All right. Welcome tonight, folks, to uh, tonight's presentation, The Truth About Shoulder Pain. I am going to share my screen. This thing has changed just a little bit. How do I share my screen now? This is, oh, there it is. All right. So you should see my screen. The lead page says the truth about shoulder pain. My name is Troy Vandermole, and I really do appreciate the time that you're giving me tonight. Prior to COVID, we did a lot of these in person, and we still are doing. We've returned to doing some of them in person as well. But I, I do about one per month on different um, body aches and pains, different joints. And tonight's will be very similar to a lot of them that I've done online. In person, it's pretty easy to interact. It's a little bit more difficult. Um, using Zoom, uh, but there is a way to interact. That chat button is something that you can click at any point in time to ask questions. Um, there tends to be set, lots of people on these, so it's hard to respond to every question. So if I don't get to it in real time, I promise to you that I will respond to those questions uh, at a later date. Um, if you ever want to contact me as well, you can do that. You have the emails that you've been getting once you've registered and you can continue. You can respond to those. Those will eventually get to me. I will give you my contact information at the end of tonight's session. Uh, who am I? Well, let me get, just give you a really, really brief introduction. Uh, physical therapist. I've been a physical therapist for a long time. Hard to believe, but it's been 28 years already after graduating from the University of Iowa in 1996 and then Eventually going on a little over 10 years ago to get my transitional doctorate in physical therapy. I've been with the company I'm uh, with right now, Kinetic Edge Physical Therapy, now for over 23 years. Kinetic Edge has existed, albeit with a different name, about 10 years ago. We've been around since 1998, so I think this December is our 26th anniversary as a company. We are about to open our ninth clinic. We're already in Ames, and we're going to add another one to the north side of Ames next week, Monday. Uh, what you're going to learn tonight is about what I learned in school. What you're going to learn tonight is about what I've learned since I've gotten out of school over 28 years. And shoulder problems are really common. It's the second most common reason that people come see us at our clinic. And you know, what you're going to learn tonight is not just what I've learned, but what me and all my colleagues have learned together. We have about 40 PT or PTA providers. And uh, with shoulder problems being the second most prevalent issue that we help people with, it is something that we see a lot and learn a lot about that. And so that experience is going to work to your benefit tonight. Some people sit here now on the other side of the screen and wonder, is this really the place for me? Well, I'll tell you about the typical person that comes to these workshops. These people may have experienced a really sudden onset injury. Most people, it's not a sudden onset injury. It's something that has existed and um kind of started insidiously. And, and at the start, it maybe wasn't too bad, but over time it gets worse and worse and worse. And, and because it hurts worse, they start to do less. They don't do things they want to be able to do or they can't enjoy the things that they want to do as well as possible. And um, as Americans, we're used to being as independent as possible. Many people that come to these uh, workshops, many people that come into our clinics are people that just want to make sure they can do what they need to be able to do and don't have to be dependent upon others. Uh, people with shoulder problems in particular oftentimes have difficulties at night. Nighttime pain can be a really difficult thing. One of the truths we're going to talk about tonight is that we are impacted most by the people around us, and we impact those around us the most, for better or worse as well. One of the things you're going to learn about the shoulder is it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's a part of a movement system. It's impacted by the stuff for, uh, around it as well. That's a key point of what we're going to talk about tonight. But as it pertains to you, you understand that if you can't do and you hurt, it is hard to be in a good mood. And it's hard to be positive, to have a positive impact on people around you. And so if you're saying, I'm hurting, I don't like it, I want to be able to do more and depend upon myself, I want to be in a better mood, I want to take care of myself and my family. And if possible, I want to be able to do this uh, while avoiding uh, risky procedures. This is the place for you. We're going to talk about natural ways to help your shoulder pain. Now, if you are get, coming here tonight expecting that, do these two, three exercises, and in a week you'll feel 100%. I wish that was the case. In a little bit, we'll talk about different types of trauma, and you'll appreciate with this cumulative trauma, it can't do one thing for a little while to make it go away because it's not just one thing that's brought it on. It's a part of a larger systemat systematic problem. 
we're going to talk about that tonight. So if you were hoping for the quick fix, uh, if it were available, I'd give it to you, but it's not. Uh, that, that being said, what I'm going to tell you tonight is not highly complex. It's pretty simple stuff that needs to be repeated a little bit over time to get the intended results. And so that is the goal for tonight. Now, there we go. That's a better one. Um, I want you to answer a question if you would. Let's be a little interactive right now. Click on that chat button right now. The first question is the most important one. At the top of your screen there, you can see what activity that you do is most likely to contribute to or cause your shoulder pain. Are there specific things that you do that you say, if I do that, I know my shoulder's going to hurt. So answer that if you can. In a little bit, I'll look at the chat and we'll, we'll see what the response is. If you want to tell me in addition to that, how bad that pain is on a one to 10 scale, one meaning almost no pain and 10 meaning emergency room level pain. I want to know how high that level gets. And then finally, how long have you been experiencing it? Has it been days, weeks, months, years? The answer to the first question is the most important one. If there's something that brings it on, that's actually in a weird way, good news. Uh, and if you answer positively that, yes, there is something that makes it worse, I'm going to tell you I've got some positive news for you. The other two questions, how bad it hurts and how long it's been around, that is less likely to tell me if what I've got is going to be beneficial for you. But it could have some impact on um, how long it's going to take. If you've been dealing with this for longer and longer periods of time, um, and your pain level seven, eight out of 10, those things tend to take just a little bit more time to overcome. Uh, but ultimately, if there's something that makes it hurt, that is good news. So Jennifer says driving, lifting, just using it in general, and it's been for years. Okay, that's good to know, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer. Uh, we're gonna talk some of those things that, that you just said, uh, you'll see on my next screen. Lori says any movement, uh, level six in about six months. Okay, so a little bit higher level of pain. We get lots of people that come to the clinic that have been dealing with shoulder pain for years. So six months, though, it's plenty long. Uh, it's a little bit easier to deal with those things. Sharon says, trying to get comfortable at night, going to sleep. Yes, that nighttime pain. Uh, reaching, front-loading washing machine. Yep. Uh, reaching into an upper kitchen cabinet. How about, uh, Sharon, reaching into the refrigerator? Get lots of people that say that. Um, Sharon's pain can go up to a seven going on for just two months. Okay, that's kind of good news. That's not as long as many. And another person that just gave their phone number, seven or eight out of 10, a couple months ago. Good, good. Yeah, more of you responded, uh, and that's good information. You might be asking, though, why in the world is it good to say, yes, there is something that makes my pain worse? Well, here's why. Gosh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Here's the, a little limerick that might be helpful for you. If your pain is reproducible, then it's also reducible, okay? Let me say that again. If your pain is reproducible with a specific activity, then it's also reducible. Because we know if something makes it worse, it's mechanical. We're gonna talk about what mechanical pain is in a little bit. So the things that I most often hear are reaching, lifting, and laying down. And you already heard that in the responses that we got uh, um, from those of you that responded just a little bit ago. Now, let's talk very briefly about trauma. Uh, when you hear the word trauma, what comes to your mind? Most people will say things immediately. What comes to their mind are things like motor vehicle accidents or slips, trips, and falls, broken bones, and all that kind of stuff. Those are definitely traumas. And what those kind of traumas are would be described as being acute trauma. Acute trauma comes on suddenly. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, now I know why I'm having issues here. Let me do this. That's going to be a lot easier if I do it this way. What you're going to see on acute trauma is this. It comes on suddenly. And then over time, it slowly reduces. This is possible because acute trauma is caused by one incident, one stressor. And when it comes on, the tissue is damaged. But when that stress is removed, if it's in a single acute incident, then the body is made to get better. And in most cases, unless it's really significant amounts of trauma, we're going to get below the symptom threshold and do just fine. Okay, now we see people in the clinic with this issue all the time, all kinds of acute traumatic issues, broken bones, um, you know, uh, tearing of a rotator cuff sometimes can be a traumatic issue because someone 
hold on the arm or to catch themselves when they fall. All those are true. But the most common reason that people come to see us are due not to acutely traumatic incidents, but cumulative trauma. Cumulative trauma is different. It's not one incident. It is little incidents repeated over and over again over long periods of time. So that second arrow that went up gradually took a few seconds on my screen. Uh, but the reality is for most people, cumulative trauma is months, if not years, to develop. And you can see at the bottom here, this uh, first part of cumulative trauma is below the symptom threshold. So changes are occurring and we're not even cognizant of it because we're not yet feeling anything. But once it gets above the symptom threshold, then we start to notice something. But at that early stage above the symptom threshold, most people will say it doesn't hurt all the time and it's not horrible. It's different, but it's not bad. People downplay these issues. In fact, that's the single greatest mistake that people make is say, oh, I'm sure it's going to be fine. Um, in some rare cases, it, it gets better and it stays better. But in most cases, that's not the case, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Because when you don't do anything to eliminate that, which is causing these little bits of trauma repetitively over time, that thing tends to get worse. And the higher that error goes, the more severe your symptoms are. Why in the world do I have those buckets on there? Well, the bucket analogy for me is a good way to understand how cumulative trauma develops. Cumulative trauma um, is slow and insidious, but it's kind of predictable. The first sign when a little water fills your bucket, this is the analogy, right? Uh, the first sign people have is they just feel more fatigued, right? So um, I'm talking general fatigue here first. I'm 52 years old. I've been a physical therapist for over half my life. If you do the math, you've already figured that out. Um, being a physical therapist isn't high degree of labor. It's not labor intensive, but I can tell you at the end of the week now, compared to when I was 24 and just getting out in the physical therapy world, I need more rest each night and, and on the weekends than I used to. Now, with regard to, for example, shoulders, people will do tasks that they used to be able to do more easily. And they're like, I'm not used to painting walls. I can feel that. Um, people that start to develop a little bit of shoulder trauma will say, eh, it feels tired. I'm not as strong as I used to be, but you know what? That's normal. And you know what? It is normal. We're not meant to last forever. No one has yet. So it's easy to excuse this level. We're not spring chickens anymore, right? So we just keep doing the same things over and over again. Right? More water fills the bucket. What happens next? In many cases, if not most, fatigue is going to give way to discomfort. Now, discomfort is more significant than fatigue, but it's not pain. Uh, the most common adjectives used to describe discomfort would be uh, stiffness and soreness. I feel stiff and I feel a little bit sore. Again, most will say it's not horrible. Yeah, it's getting a little bit worse, but you know what? I'll be fine. Okay. So we just keep doing the same stuff and more water fills the bucket. And when you get past discomfort, then it's pain. This is a different level of symptom. It hurts. It's different than just being a little stiff and sore. And we are really close to having an overflow off the top of the bucket there. And when we do that, that is true tissue injury. Tissue injury that requires uh, each level of this to get rid of it requires more time, intensity of effort. And in some cases, when by the time you get to the tissue injury, it can be more, more cost as well. Here's another way to look at it. You see my screen there that's railroad tracks. If you look carefully into the distance, what do you see? A train is rounding the bend there, right? So just imagine you, this looks like a fall uh, scene, right? Imagine you are actually on those railroad tracks and there's nothing as far as the eye can see. You might hear the wind and some birds, that stuff. But um, when that train does start to approach, the first thing you might notice is a distant whistle. Okay, maybe the tracks start to rattle just a little bit. It's not that big of a deal. There's no pending doom with that. But the closer and closer that train gets, the symptoms get louder. Okay, the rattle gets more significant. The horn's getting louder. You're, you're, you're sensing something more significant is going on. That is cumulative trauma. If you stay on that same path, unfortunately, bad things tend to be the outcome of that. What are those checkpoints along the way? Well, when you get just above that symptom threshold on the graph, 
the pain frequency, the pain intensity and pain duration is relatively mild. But as the terrain approaches, as you experience more water in your bucket, as this cumulative trauma develops, that pain becomes more frequent, that pain becomes, becomes more intense, and the episodes of pain are greater in duration. And the unfortunate thing is this is not good for your shoulder, um, but it has a larger overall impact too. When we hurt more, we do less. When we do less, this has a negative impact on our general health. Uh, there are six things that Americans spend, about 86%, I think the number is, six different areas of our health, whereby Americans spend about 86% of their healthcare dollars. Easily the number one cost are musculoskeletal issues. Shoulder pain, back pain, hip pain, ankle pain, knee pain, those are all examples of musculoskeletal issues. It's the number one medical spend in America by a long shot. It's more than numbers two and three combined, by the way. Number two, I think, is um, cancer. Number three, no, number two is um, uh, heart disease. Three is cancer. And then we have obesity, depression, uh, and, 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 and I can't remember the last one right now. But my point is this, all of those things minus cancer, obesity, depression, musculoskeletal issues, um, and, and degenerative changes are all impacted, for better or worse, by our quality and quantity of movement. So doing things that are good for your shoulder tend to be good for your general health and, and for your overall medical condition. Our goal is for you to feel better and be able to do more and more. Like I said earlier, most of the time when we're met with a problem at its origin, we tend to ignore it, and that is a problem. I am sitting in the newer part of a 109-year-old home. We moved in here nine years ago, and uh, we had our insurance company come and take a look at the place. Yes, we will cover you, they said, except for that roof. Those shingles are old. You need to replace them before we'll put them on your plan. And I looked at this big old house and said, that's a big roof. That's not going to be a cheap expense. And then I went inside and I looked and I said, my ceiling looks healthy. I don't see any issues. So I, have, I was told there was a problem and I ignored it. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I ignored it for a few years and I eventually did get it fixed. Thankfully, before anything worse happened, but I was playing uh, I was gambling with an issue with this. I ignored it. And if I ignored it too long, it was actually going to lead to more expense, more significant pain to me, at least in my pocketbook. But that's what people do when they experience a problem. They ignore it as long as they possibly can. And for most uh, reasons, it's, it's you know what, it's not that bad. We can downplay that. Uh, you are not in that category because you're here tonight. Um, unfortunately, the first thing that most people do uh, and that's oftentimes not even your fault, but we seek outcomes that it don't really get to the root of the problem. They just kind of mask it or alter it. And this happens in the medical world all the time. Medications, injections, surgeries, none of them ask the question, why did it occur and how can I avoid that? It just deals with the symptoms related to the problem, the outcome of the problem, not the question behind the question, what caused it in the first place. So what we're going to talk about tonight is how do we get to the root of the problem to truly solve it? That's my promise for you. Now, we're going to talk in a little bit about the most common types of shoulder pain. The second category that we're going to talk about is the most important. What's the true cause of it? And then we're going to talk about you know, how do we actually respond to that cause and do something about it. And you're going to nod your head a lot. I think this makes a lot of sense when you think about it conceptually. You'll probably say, why haven't I heard this stuff before? Um but you're going to hear the most common causes, but in this format, I can't help you figure out which one or ones apply to you. So there is something else I'm going to offer you. If you're signing up tonight, there's another uh, free offer thing I want to give to you. In order to understand this whole process, before we get into that, I want you to understand this. In the Western world, our medicine te tends to kind of uh, deal with things from a medical bias standpoint. And in many cases, that can be an effective way of dealing with health-related issues. With regard to these musculoskeletal things, it's really not the best way of looking at it because it's not so much a medical issue as it is a mechanical issue. So let me tell you what that means. Um, let's say this past week, and it was really nice, right? So you got out in the car, your favorite car, you put the top down, it's convertible, uh, the weather is perfect, 
and uh, you're cruising. And then all of a sudden a light goes on in your dashboard. And if you're like me and many people, uh, if you don't see any other evidence of a problem, your tendency is to ignore it, right? I've done that all the time. There's a bad sensor. You can't trust that thing. It's fine, right? And, and in most cases, we're okay with that. But let's say you continue riding along and that light's on. You didn't respond to it. Now suddenly you start to feel a little rattling under the hood and a little smoke starts to come off. You can smell something is not right. Clearly, you're going to pull off on the side of the road at that point, right? Now, what if you pop the hood and then pop the trunk? Because you knew in the trunk there was this thick old blanket. And you go grab that blanket because you're going to throw that on top of the engine compartment. And then you're going to slam that hood down, right? Now I can't see the problem. I can't hear the problem because I've muffled it. I've kind of captured all that smoke. It's not going to be able to get out. Problem solved, right? No, we haven't gotten to the root of the problem because there's a mechanical issue. We've just covered up the symptoms. That's kind of how we are in America. We cover up symptoms. And that's what medications, injections, and surgeries do. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. There is a time for some medications. There's a time uh, for injections for some people. There's a time for some surgeries. Uh, but if you have an issue and want to get rid of the things that have caused these mechanical breakdowns, you got to ask the question behind the question. What brought that on in the first place? You can't lift up your shirt sleeve and say, hey, look at that dial. It's low on ibuprofen. I just need some more ibuprofen and I'll be fine. That's all I need. That's not the way to take care of it. These are movement-based issues. There's a mechanical stress applying uh, applied to that tissue that's causing problems. And unless you get rid of that mechanical stress, the likelihood of it getting, coming back and getting worse over time is greater. And I've worked with tons of people who've done all that stuff, medications, injections, even surgeries, and come back and like, I still have an issue. Let's ask the question behind the question. Why is it there in the first place? Now, I'm not going to get deep into the weeds with this, but we are kind of conditioned when we are told, yeah, that area is kind of inflamed. Well, there's something to do about inflammation, right? We've got these anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that are prescribed for us when we have inflammation. I do want you to understand that inflammation is a normal part of the healing process. Uh, when you have an injury to a tissue, from about day three to the end of the third week, we are in the inflammation stage. It's normal and it's necessary. And actually, this inflammation stage prepares the body to do what it does naturally as it heals. The development in the early stages of some blood vasc vascular growth. And then over time, if we allow that process to occur, it proliferates and it matures. And that tissue gets fully inundated with the um, blood flow and the nutrients brought by the blood to that tissue. So the question is, if I do an anti-inflammatory, what's happening? Well, sometimes it's fool's gold. It'll make you feel better, but it stunts a natural process and prevents us from getting to the point where it fully matures and has the nutrients it needs to be healthy. So my encouragement is don't just pop uh, the over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. Ask the question behind the question. What's the root? Now, before we talk about those most um, common types of shoulder pain, I want to briefly tell you about a gentleman that I treated. This has been almost 25 years ago. One of my earlier experiences as a physical therapist, I was in Cedar Rapids at the time, and this 92-year-old guy named John came in. This is not John. I don't have his picture because it's 25 years later, but this reminds me of John. And uh, he came in. He was an active 92-year-old, good um, um, mentally, and he, he came in and said, I've got a really bad shoulder. It hurts. I can't lift it. Uh, he couldn't get to the top of his head. And he's like, uh, I've been told I've got a massive tear. That's the word that they use. If you've ever had an MRI, you might've heard that number before. And he's like, I don't want to do a surgery. They don't want to do it to me. I don't want to go through that. I just want to be able to feel better and function better. Now, Many people in this situation, because they want to be able to do things better and can't, it is common that our clients are dealing with some level of anxiety, even some depression, when they've got a chronic issue that's getting worse and worse and worse. That was not John. John was just like, help me do anything I can to make this better. And I was honest with him. I said, I don't know if I can fix this, but I know that there's lots of things we can do. 
to make all these parts move better together. If that rotator cuff is massively torn, I can't make it mend itself, but we'll do everything we can to help the entire system move better. And so we did an assessment, found out what he was capable of, what was limited. Of those limitations, what can we actually do? And he put the effort in, and in about six to eight weeks, he was to the point where he'd get his hand to his head, he could get some stuff out of the cupboard, and he said, I have a little discomfort, but it's not bad at all. I am really happy with that. So I'm here to tell you, uh, if John at age 92 can do this, you can too. So let's talk about shoulders and the most common types of shoulder pain. In order to understand this, you got to have just a little basic understanding about what the shoulder is. The shoulder is actually four bones. Um, the rotator cuff, which is part of your shoulder complex, has four distinct muscles. Uh, the major bones involved are your shoulder blade. That's on the backside of your rib cage, your collarbone or clavicle. That clavicle connects to the bone that comes around from the back of the scapula or shoulder blade called the acromion. And most of the stuff that gets injured when you have shoulder uh, issues is in this. It's called the subacromial space. It's below the acromion bone underneath this ligament that goes from these two bones that make up your shoulder blade. Through there is one of the four rotator cuff tendons. And then there's a bursa in there. And so if you've ever heard of bursitis, that's when that um, abursal sac, in this case, the subacromial bursa, and the shoulder can get irritated and inflamed as subacromial bursitis. And uh, the amount of pressure on those structures underneath there can be affected by the shape of that acromion. Some people are just made with a hooked acromion. It's going to create more downward pressure on there. We're going to talk a little bit about the mechanics of your shoulder and how to make sure that thing does what it needs to be able to do dynamically without applying too much stress on these tissues in the subacromial space. Uh, one thing you have to be aware of is that the entire body moves three-dimensionally. So again, we're not going to go into a lot of um, detail on that, but if you think about your spine, right, your spine can flex and extend. That's movement in the sagittal plane. It can go left and right side bend, which is movement in the frontal plane, and then it rotates left and right. That's movement in the transverse plane. Your shoulder is the most dynamic of joints, and it is three-dimensional as well. And uh, a point that I made briefly earlier that I want to emphasize right now is your shoulder doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is impacted by a bunch of stuff around it. It's called a dynamic system. There's a whole series of movements that have to take place. And at the shoulder, we take, uh, take for granted, I guess, um, when everything's working well. And then we wonder what's going on when things are not working so well. And um, the answer to the question of why am I having stress in that tissue, uh, tissue in that subacromial space often um, lies with, well, what's happening to the system around that shoulder, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, let's talk about the three most common types. I want you to understand that when I talk about a shoulder type, I'm describing it, but we are not yet talking about causes. Uh, the same um, foundational cause can lead to a variety of different types of shoulder pain issues, depending upon which tissue is experiencing the mechanical stress and how long that tissue has been experiencing the, the mechanical stress. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight are actually kind of the progression uh, of the same issue in three different stages. So usually what happens is we have a little bit of osteoarthritis in, in the shoulder, that can create pressure on tissues that eventually brings on impingement. And when that impingement has occurred over and over again, it can lead to a strain of the rotator cuff tendon and eventually a tear as it progressively worsens cumulatively, right? That shouldn't be surprising to you. Let's talk about a very common issue, osteoarthritis. This literally means, well, let's go backwards. Itis is inflammation, arth is a joint, osteo is bone. So osteoarthritis is, it is actually uh, the, the presence of inflammatory materials in the joint that's made between two bones. Uh, in the joint of your shoulder, like every other joint, you have cartilage in there. Cartilage is a, um, an aneural tissue. So if you've heard of people having cartilage damage in their knees, you can have cartilage damage in your shoulder as well. But that is not painful because cartilage itself doesn't have any nerves. It's aneural. So it is not the direct cause of shoulder pain. 
but it is evidence that there's mechanical stress acting upon that joint. And there are other tissues in the joint that are susceptible to pain because there are nerves in that tissue. So you might've been told you have bone spurs or osteophytes. Some people even hear the word bone on bone or the phrase bone on bone. Uh, that happens more at the hip and the knee that that phrase is used. And it's kind of a misnomer, but we won't get into that now. But I want you to understand this, that the presence of a pathology is no predictor of pain. In fact, there are tons of people out there that have no shoulder pain that if you actually took a picture with an MRI or an X-ray, you're going to find abnormalities very commonly. As the third bullet point says, 89% of 40-year-olds that have no shoulder pain will have evidence of osteoarthritis if they did an MRI of that shoulder. So no shoulder pain, almost 9 out of 10 of them are going to have evidence of osteoarthritis if they're 40 years old. That's crazy, isn't it? But you need to know this. Osteoarthritis is a normal part of aging. It's as normal as wrinkles on the skin, and it does not predict the presence of pain. The problem is we equate it because we don't get MRIs unless we have pain. And we have, we have pain, we get an MRI, and then we see evidence of something that's not ideal. We equate the two. But that's not necessarily the case. Now, if you have osteoarthritis... Uh, development of bone spurs, and that can put pressure on tissues in there, eventually that can lead to something called impingement. That is shoulder pain type number two that we're going to talk about. Now, remember that subacromial space? We've got the supraspinatus. That's one of the four rotator cuff muscles that travels right through that tunnel, and then it's protected by a bursa, which is intended to be a, uh, a pressure reducer. This shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint that moves three-dimensionally. Uh, your hip, too, is a ball and socket joint, but that hip joint is really deep. The socket's really deep. The, the ball fits well within that. The hip has mobility in three dimensions, but it's not nearly as mobile as the shoulder, and that's because your shoulder, it's been likened to, to a, a golf ball on a tee, big ball, small socket, okay? And the normal mechanical action of an overhead reach on the left here, you can see that as you elevate, it's intended for this supraspinatus tendon to pull on it so that ball rotates on the socket. But oftentimes what happens is there is poor function of that muscle in terms of dynamically stabilizing the ball in the socket. So instead of it rotating and staying in good proximity, it elevates and it pushes upward into those tissues, the supraspinatus tendon and the bursa. And with enough repetition over time, Remember, cumulative stress, little by little, um, it can eventually create an inflammatory response, which makes you hurt. That is impingement. Now, uh, it not as, uh, the, the presence of impingement is not easily detectable with diagnostic testing. There is uh, a narrowing of the space, so there's more mechanical pressure that leads to friction and therefore an inflammatory response. Very treatable. Uh -huh. if you think about how that shoulder functions as a part of the dynamic system that's around it. Uh, these um, types of issues, when you're in a state of impingement, will, you will often experience nighttime shoulder pain. For those of you that experience that, this is very likely uh, your issue. Now, I want you to know this. The, the body is made to withstand stress and mechanical pressure, tensions, those kind of things. Um, but we have a uh, system limitation, right? That can only... Um, account for so much stress over time. So pain only becomes present when those forces exceed the threshold of that tissue. That's why it takes time and repetition to get you to that point. But those symptoms are going to continue and likely worsen if you don't mitigate the stressors that are acting upon those tissues. And if you don't, that which is inflamed in causing um, an impingement situation can eventually lead to progressive wear and tear that results in what you see here, a true rotator cuff tear. Most rotator cuff tears are cumulative. Um, there are some acute ones where an otherwise healthy rotator cuff experiences a stress that tears it, but most of the time it's a process whereby it happens slowly and then there is one final stress that becomes the straw that breaks the camel's back. Again, the same question behind the question needs to apply. What movements are occurring that are creating mechanical pressure on that tissue, which uh, uh, 
um, cause it to uh, progress from being an impingement related issue to a tendonitis bursitis to ultimately a rotator cuff tear? That's the question that needs to be answered. Now, again, I said sometimes MRIs and diagnostic testing can be misleading. The presence of a pathology is no predictor of pain. There's tons of people uh, that have no pain and pathologies are present when you do testing, uh, diagnostic testing of the shoulder. It's actually an interesting study done. Uh, it's been a while ago, over a decade ago, where they had people with shoulder pain go through a surgery, um, but they were in one or two categories. Uh, one group had a true surgery where they tried to clean and, 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 and repair that stuff. The other one, uh, it was a sham surgery. They just went in there, didn't do anything. And they found that outcomes, when you look at long-term outcomes, there was no difference no statistically significant difference between those that had the real surgery and those that had the sham surgery. Okay, so that's very interesting. And by the way, these uh, findings of pathologies in people that have no pain, um, this is true at all kinds of joints, the knees, the hips, the back, the neck, the ankles and feet. The presence of pathologies and equal pain. Don't try to fix uh, pathologies. Try to ask the question behind the question. What mechanical stresses are creating uh, a mechanical stress that brings on an inflammatory response and therefore pain. That's a great segue to what are the actual causes. So when I talk about causes, I talk about the true culprit, the, the real issue. And then sometimes there is a culprit. And in some of you, there are multiple culprits. Okay. So remember we said earlier that the body is meant to move three-dimensionally. All its parts are meant to move three-dimensionally. And uh, under ideal circumstances, there is a balance between mobility and stability. If someone is way too stable and not mobile enough, that's a problem. On the other side of the equation, there are some people that are way too mobile and not stable enough. That is a problem too. We need to have a balance between mobility and stability, something I like to call most stability, in order to function well. A truth that I said at the start and that I'm going to reiterate right now is this. The tissue that receives the stress is usually not the problem area. It is the recipient of stress because some other problem area isn't doing its job. Okay? So the, uh, the, the solution to this issue is find out what's not doing its job and passing the buck to something else. So let me give you another analogy. You've all seen uh, manufacturing environments and, and the assembly line, Right. Imagine there's a there's a group of three people that are doing some work on a, a widget, okay? A person A does a little work, person B does a little work, person C does a little work, and then it gets shipped off. What if person B said, you know what? I'm not going to do my job. I'm not going to do what I'm designed to do. Person A has to pick up the slack. Person C has to pick up the slack. And if that happens day in and day out, who suffers as a result of that? Person B has kind of got it easy. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not going to have mechanical cumulative stresses uh, affecting them. But the people that are doing their job plus a little of someone else's job are experiencing more stress. And over time, that becomes the issue. So as their supervisor, if I went and said, boy, you like your sore person A, maybe a little back rub would help you. How about per you, person C? You want some ibuprofen? And they might say, you know what? That kind of feels good, but you know, person B, that's the issue. So I'm telling you, your person B, in the case of your shoulder, is either your shoulder blade, your hips, or your mid-back, or some combination of those three things. So let's talk a little bit about your shoulder blade. It's an amazing uh, structure. Uh, there are actually 21 muscles, 21 individual muscles that attach to your shoulder blade. Uh, clear evidence that it's a really, really important structure when that many things are connecting to it. Uh, it's kind of like your kneecap. It's a floating bone that rides on another bone. In this case, your rib cage, as opposed to the bones that make up your knee. Okay. And uh, uh, all these things have to work around together in dynamic concert of movement uh, so that it can um, uh, move and, and function very efficiently. In order to raise your arm from your side all the way to overhead, that's a half circle, it's 180 degrees. It's not all your shoulder that's doing that. Your shoulder blade actually rotates upward about 60 degrees. That's what's getting depicted down here with the green arrow. 
The other 120 degrees comes from the humerus, the upper arm bone moving relative to the shoulder blade. So that full 180, two thirds of it comes from arm movement and one third of it comes from shoulder blade movement. So I wanna show you this. This is a video, I think it'll work fine. What we're seeing here is just the skeleton, but the skeleton with the right arm is gonna go through, I think three distinct motions. I think it goes through uh, flexion first, then abduction, and then uh, horizontal induction. I'll, I'll walk you through it. What I want you to see though is what happens to your shoulder blade when that arm moves through different, um, in, in different directions. Oh, come on. There we go. All right. So this is, I think this is abduction, raising the arm to the side. See how much upward rotation occurs at that uh, shoulder blade, and that maintains the integrity of that joint space that's on the socket and that subacromial region. So we can't see those soft tissues, but we know if that happens well and it dances, if that shoulder blade can't move, the arm's going to lift up and hit into that subacromial space. Now, I think now they lift it straight up in front to about 90 degrees. You can see the shoulder blade again is coming away from the midline. And if they went any higher than 90, you'd see that upper rotation happening again. They went up to 90 there. Okay. Now, the last thing this person is doing, I think they're going to reach behind them to try to get to their back pocket. See how much retraction that shoulder blade has to do to maintain space between that ball and socket joint. It's an amazing dance. And when your shoulder blade doesn't move the way it's intended, it's like a dance partner stepping on the toes. When the when the partner moves and the and the and the uh, other dancer doesn't move, they're going to get their toes stepped on. Okay, there we go. So the shoulder blade has to move in concert with your upper arm bone in order to maintain the integrity of that subacromial space, and that often in a lot of people's uh, uh, bodies does not work well. The shoulder blade muscles can get tight and lock that shoulder blade down. If the thoracic spine doesn't move well and gets locked down, rib cage doesn't move, that shoulder blade can get stuck and it doesn't rotate and move back and forth the way it ought to. And therefore you get more pressure there. So you need that shoulder blade to move well. As I'm looking at the baseball game over here, I think the Yankees are up five to two, by the way, after the Dodgers taking an early 2-0 lead. But uh, I played a lot of baseball growing up, coached my kids. My kids played a lot of baseball and softball. Uh, uh, imagine this, if you would. Uh, let's say there was a new rule put into place in baseball that uh, players could only throw the ball seated on their backside. Okay? So the ball's hitting the gap to run after it. They sit on their bottom and they try to throw that ball to home. No. They plant their foot. They engage their hip, which engages their trunk, which engages their shoulder blade, which gets their arm moving to create this whip effect that lets that ball go. About 50% of the power of your arm comes from your hip. And you can see the way these connective tissues are made in the body. There are different views at different depths of all these connective tissues, how there's a connection between your left shoulder and your right side, your right shoulder and your left side on the back side, even on the front side, from right to left and from left to right. There are fascial bands that allow for us to distribute stresses and movements from one side to the other, top to bottom with that. So again, your hip is a three-dimensional um, joint as well. It has to flex and extend, abduct and adduct, rotate right, rotate left. There are six directions of movement, and your hip needs to have a balance between mobility and stability. In some cases, a, a stiff hip uh, reduces the ability to create uh, movement, uh, transfer movement into your upper extremities. In other cases, the hip is way too mobile. Uh, a balance between that's really, really important. I will tell you this, uh, hip issues are a common denominator in all kinds of musculoskeletal issues. The closest neighbors of your hips, just above your low back and your knee. So if you've had low back and knee issues and you also have shoulder issues, the hips are very likely to be one of the contributing factors to that. You need to make sure the hip's working well. And I alluded to this when I was talking about the, uh, the, the shoulder blade, too. The movement of your shoulder blade is kind of fed by movement of your thoracic spine and the ribs. 
So when the ribs and the thoracic spine don't move well, and usually um, while the hip might be too mobile or too stable, it, it's almost always the case of the thoracic spine being too stiff, too stable. I only remember a couple occasions with uh, prepubescent um, girls who were into gymnastics that have way too mobile a thoracic spine. 99.99% .99 of people that have spine issues have tightness of the thoracic spine, not too much mobility. And limitation of movement of the thoracic spine in the rib cage will limit the ability of the um, shoulder blade and therefore the shoulder to do its job. Extra stress is applied to those tissues and that's the cumulative mechanical impact. So the bottom line is this, if you've uh, had shoulder issues and you've sought any type of help and the person that's uh, trying to help you has only looked at the shoulder, um, medications, injections, surgeries, those kind of things, and didn't ask the question, well, how's the shoulder working as a part of the overall dynamic movement system? Uh, if you haven't had your shoulder blade mobility assessed, your hip mobility and stability assessed, your thoracic spine mobility assessed, it is very likely uh, one or more root causes have not been identified or fixed. And your shoulder blade is simply uh, taking on more stress than it was designed to take on because of an inability elsewhere. So it will not be surprising for you to hear me say this. If you really wanna get rid of the pain, um, manage it better, instead of just treating the symptoms, you gotta look at that root cause. And unfortunately, the most common treatments are not root cause treatments. Um, medications, injections, and surgeries just mask the issue. So successful treatment says, how does this shoulder work in concert with everything around it? It's very individualized because we need to find in you what the limiting factors are. Is it a mobility or stability issue? at the shoulder blade? Is it a mobility or stability issue at the hip? Is it a mobility issue at your thoracic spine? What's right for you is right for you, but may not be right for another person that has a different um, root cause. So, and then you also have to remember that you have to consider the fact that this shoulder is a part of the whole body. And ultimately there are things we do with our hands to mobilize tight shoulders. There are things that we do with our hands to help certain muscles work a little bit better but your body operates between gravity and the ground and your body needs to get feedback. The shoulder needs to get feedback from the thoracic spine and the hip and all the way down to the floor. So it requires real functional movements and hands-on activities can be really good. I really like hands-on activities that happen when your foot's on the ground because that's where life occurs. And that whole process is educational, meaning this is what you need to do now, but as your body changes, here's what you need to do in future stages. So you're empowered to do the right thing at the right time to take stress off that tissue. And I can uh, uh, promise you this, eliminating mechanical stress or reducing mechanical stress on tissues that have been experiencing that and therefore giving you progressive symptoms will feel better and function better if you can find and eliminate the root cause issue. Now, that makes a lot of sense conceptually. I think you'll agree but we haven't solved every problem in the world yet. First of all, there's no way you're going to remember all this stuff because our memories are limited. Uh, second of all, you still don't know what your specific issue is or issues are. And uh, usually it's not just one issue. There's multiple issues contributing to these things. And even though we like to say knowledge is power, uh, knowledge is only effective and powerful if we can put it into practice. You have to be able to implement it. So that's why I want to offer you for giving me your time tonight, the opportunity to meet with somebody for 20 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, to answer some simple questions and for our shoulder expert to do some simple, basic assessments of your thoracic mobility, of your shoulder blade mobility and stability, and your hip mobility and stability. And in a very short period of time, you'll get a great understanding of what type of shoulder pain you're dealing with, what the root issue or issues are uh, that are contributing to that, and what a process to make it get better would look like over time so that you can get confidence, some direction, and some hope. So uh, I used to be a little bit less bold in saying these things, but I've been doing this way too long. There are way too many people suffering unnecessarily, spending all kinds of time, energy, and effort, and real money on things that do not get to the root of the problem. I want you to understand your problem well, find a path to making the uh, shoulder function better by eliminating the stress naturally, 
and not having to go through things that cost money that don't give you ultimate relief. So you can be dependent upon yourself instead of others. Now, this 20 minutes uh, uh, in the open market, it's about $150 value. It's absolutely free. And I want you to understand there are no strings attached. We're going to give you good information. From that point in time, whether you do anything with it, it is not a hard sell. It is completely up to you. And at the very least, you'll have information uh, so that when you're ready to act on it, you know what to do about that. I can't give you a money back uh, guarantee because we're not taking your money. But since it's $150 of value, I'll tell you, if you go through it and say, that wasn't worth my time, tell us. We'll do $150 to a charity of your choice. Uh, we've never had anyone actually take us up on that because it is not wasteful. You're going to get good information. that and, and, and what's free to you is you'll get a consultation summary that says, here are the problems. Here's what it take uh, would take. Here's a strategy that it can help you actually get to the root of the problem and fix that problem. So this is the last thing I'm gonna ask of you tonight. You can get out your QR code thing and do this if you want to. The easiest thing you can do is this. Uh, click on that chat button again. And if you wanna spend 20 minutes um, with one of our uh, shoulder experts, just say I'm in. And then we have to know this, where do you wanna do it? So we have clinics in Des Moines. Well, I'll start, we got two in Ames now. We're in Des Moines, we're in Colfax and Newton, Ella Oskaloosa, Centerville and Albia. So you need to say, I'm in, and which clinic you want to do this in. It's 20 minutes only. We're straight to the point, and you'll have really good information to understand what's causing it and what you can actually do about that. Okay, we got a few people uh, chiming in here. Let's see here. Sharon says, yes, I want to do it, and she wants to do it in Pella. Good. Sharon, we will have our Pella care coordinator give me a call. Lori says, yes, she'd like to do it in Ames. Um, when, when the person calls you in Ames, Lori, you'll just have to say whether you'll do it, do it on our west side, which is on Mortensen Road, just west of South Dakota, or we're opening in, um, that's in the Ames Fitness Center on the west side, and then we get, we're opening another one next Monday uh, on the Ames Fitness Center North location. So that's off of staying, so you can tell them there. Let's see, Jim, you want to do it, and you are in Albia? You're going to see me, Jim, so good job. Um, I'll, I'll give you a call in the next day or two to get you on the schedule. Uh, Let's see, Jane, you just rang in. Jane, you're in. Oh, you already have an appointment at OSCE on Friday. Great. If it's for your shoulder, they're going to go through the same process with you, Jane. So they'll be able to tell you. I called the 660 number. I thought that's probably an Oskaloosa person. So that's good, Jane. Let's see. Uh, I can't read the name there. Jill, 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 yeah. Anyway, Oskaloosa, we got you. We got you. We'll get you in there. Let's see. Mike says, I want to be seen in Des Moines. Mike, we will give you a call and get you in Des Moines. That's great. Let's see if I'm missing anyone here. Okay, let me tell you this. That uh, I wanted you to get, uh, have my contact information. That phone number right there gets right to this thing, so you can call or text me if you have any questions. Uh, that email address goes right to my inbox. If you reply at all to any of the uh, emails you've been getting upon registration. My marketing team will make sure. Oh, there you go, Jackie. We got you. We'll get you in Des Moines, Jackie. If you reply to that, uh, any of those emails, they'll get that to me. My marketing team will get that to me. Uh, you are going to get an email either tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and it will have a link to this um, video. I did start the recording. I've sometimes got to the end and thought, uh, oh, shoot, I forgot to record it. But I did record this one, so you'll get that. Uh, there is a link to sign up for a free screen. So if any of you that did not sign up tonight want to do it, you can do that. But any of you that responded now, you do not need to do that. Our care coordinators will call you and get you on the schedule of time that's convenient for you to spend 20 minutes with one of our shoulder pain experts and learn about your root cause issues. Um, I would ask you one other favor. If you know anyone that's dealing with shoulder pain, I said I'm a little more bold now than I used to be. There are way too many people dealing with pain that they don't need to. They can get control of it at least. And I want you to understand this. It isn't do this for six weeks and feel 100%. But if you take physical stress, mechanical stress off that tissue, you're going to feel better. You're going to function better. Your pain frequency, intensity, and duration is going to get better because you're actually impacting the tissue. That tissue is crying out for help, like the dashboard light or all the stuff that comes from the engine. That's what your body is doing right now. So if you take the mechanical stress off that tissue, pain frequency, pain intensity, and pain duration is going to go down. I can tell you that for sure. I appreciate all of you folks. Thank you for hanging in there with me tonight. I did not quite make 45 minutes. 
So I apologize, but I hope to see all of you who attended tonight doing this. And I really appreciate your time. And I mean, if you do need to reach out at all, at the very least, consider us a resource for you. Anything musculoskeletal, we have the expertise to handle. We'd love to be uh, your choice for, for any musculoskeletal issues you might have. Thanks again for tonight. Uh, we'll see what's going on in the baseball game here soon. Take care. Bye-bye.